Dear agents, congratulations for passing through various stages of security to reach at this particular phase. You have previously viewed the scenario video pertaining to the area on mortgages. This assignment requires you to critically assess the extent to which the current law on foreclosure, possession, and sale strike an appropriate balance in protecting the interests of the mortgagee and the mortgage. Good luck, agents. I look forward to receiving your augmented reality poster presentation. Reporting for duty. Agent Hazim Ashraf. Agent Kelsey Te. Agent Amanda Rachel Chow. Agent Utra Ayer. Agent Tianhua. Have you ever heard the saying that an Englishman's home is his castle? Well, the United Kingdom is a nation of homeowners. Unlike their friends in many other European countries, the British seem to dislike renting and prefer to buy their own homes. However, the problem is that property in the United Kingdom, and particularly London, is really expensive. Most people are only able to buy their own home with the help of a mortgage from a bank or building society. So, what is a mortgage, you may ask? In the case of Sandy and Ward, Lord Justice Nenny defined a mortgage as a conveyance of land as a security for the payment of a debt or the discharge of some other obligation for which it is given. This is the idea of a mortgage, and the security is redeemable on the payment or discharge of such debt or obligation. What does this all mean? Simply put, the bank lends an individual the money to buy his or her home, and in return, the homeowner pays the bank interest on the loan and some of the outstanding debt every single month. Now, this area of land law has a lot of confusing terminology, so it is important for us to highlight a few key terms right at the start, which will be used throughout this assignment. One of the most confusing descriptions is that given to the borrower, the mortgager, and the lender, the mortgagee. When most people think about buying a home, they talk about the bank granting them a mortgage. Now, in fact, legally, it's the other way around. The homeowner grants a mortgage to the bank over his or her home and is thus known as the mortgager. In return for the charge, the bank lends the homeowner the money to buy the property, and because the bank is effectively receiving the mortgage, it is described as the mortgagee. However, before we go into that, let us explore how a mortgage is created in the first place. The law on mortgages can be defined into two distinct periods, the law before 1926 and the law after 1926, reflecting changes made in the Land Registration Act 2002. So, let us go back in time, shall we? Before 1926, there were two basic methods of creating a mortgage. Firstly, to release the land to the mortgagee, or secondly, to convey to the mortgagee the whole fee simple in the land, but subject to a proviso for redemption. The legal right to redeem was based on the contractual agreements between the parties. Failure to repay on the agreed date resulted in the strict application of common law. Furthermore, equity of redemption goes beyond the right to redeem the mortgage as seen in the case of Craiglingham. In 1925, the Law of Property Act 1925 was enacted. Under Section 85, conveyance and reconveyance were made impossible. Under the Act, two methods for the creation of mortgages were recognized. Firstly, a demise for a term of years absolute subject to a provision for lesser on redemption or secondly, a charge by deed expressed to be by way of legal mortgage. Both types of mortgage had to be created by a deed. In regards to legal mortgages, under Section 23.1a of the Land Registration Act 2002, the only way that a mortgage of registered land can be created is by a registered charge. Charges by way of a legal mortgage must be created by deed to satisfy Section 52 of the RPA 1925. The legal mortgage is regarded as a conveyance of land and will trigger the overreaching provisions 
as seen in the case of City of London and Flag. It must also state that it is intended to take effect as a charge by a legal mortgage. Under the 2002 Act, the mortgage only takes effect in law when it is entered onto the title of the registered land. It is noteworthy to mention that the law on the creation of mortgages has eventually been affected by the introduction of electronic conveyancing, as seen under Section 91 of the Act. Failure to complete the legal charge by registration will have the effect that the mortgage will not take effect in law and only in equity. Under Section 32 and 34 of the LRA 2002, entry of a notice against a mortgage registered title, which would ensure protection against any later registered disposition for value of the legal estate. If the equitable mortgage exists over unregistered land, it is registrable as a Class C-3 land charge under the LCA 1972, which will be binding on all subsequent transferees of the land. Now that we understand what is a mortgage and how it is created, an assessment on the extent to which the common law on foreclosure, possession and sale strike an appropriate balance in protecting the interests of a mortgagee and mortgager will be made. With the law on foreclosure being addressed by Kelsey, possession by both Kelsey and Amanda, and sale by Uthla. Additionally, Jenny will be addressing the topics of undue influence, backdoor tactics, and mortgages during the current COVID-19 pandemic. Furthermore, the issues faced by Mr. and Mrs. Hobson in the scenario video provided will be addressed throughout. With that said, here is Kelsey, who will be addressing the law of foreclosure. Thank you, Ashna. In the event that the mortgagor is unable to pay back the money borrowed from the mortgagee, one of the rights that the mortgagee can have recourse to is the right of foreclosure. The right of foreclosure involves the mortgagor's legal as well as equitable right to regain ownership of his or her property that was pledged as security for the money borrowed from the mortgagee being rendered now and void. To put it simply, the ownership of the mortgagor's property, be it freehold under Section 88, Subsection 2 of the Law of Property at LPA 1925, or leasehold under Section 89, Subsection 2, is vested in the mortgagee. It must be noted that in order for the mortgagee to have recourse to the right of foreclosure, the mortgagee must seek relief from the courts. This was further emphasized in the case of Refunded E.S. Irvine and Company Limited, whereby Justice Warrington stated that foreclosure could only be achieved by order of the court and not by any person. An order of foreclosure can be issued from the courts to the mortgagee in two stages. The first stage is an order of foreclosure nisi that provides the mortgagor with the last chance to pay back the money borrowed from the mortgagee within the period of time specified by the courts, usually six months according to the case of Platt and Mandel. The second stage involves an order of foreclosure absolute that vests the ownership of the mortgagor's property in the mortgagee as a result of the mortgagor's failure to avail himself or herself of the last chance. Most of the time, the mortgagee sells the mortgagor's property in order to get back the money lent to the mortgagor. The sale price does not always reflect the market value of the mortgagor's property. So, in the event that there is a deficit in the paying back of the money lent to the mortgagor, the mortgagee can aggravate the mortgagor's financial distress by bringing an action against the mortgagor for the outstanding sum. However, in the event that it is otherwise, the mortgagee can keep the excess sum. It can be said that the right of foreclosure does not strike an appropriate balance in protecting the interests of both the mortgagee and the mortgagor because the mortgagor ends up losing everything. In other words, the mortgagor is in a disadvantaged position compared to the mortgagee. For that reason, Sir Donald Nichols VC in the case of Pulp and Another and Mortgage Services Funding stated that foreclosure actions are almost unheard of today and have been so for many years. Not only the courts prefer to issue the right of 
sale instead of the right of foreclosure under section 91 subsection 2 but the mortgagee also preferred to have recourse to rights other than the right of foreclosure because according to the case of Kemba and Hollyland, an order of foreclosure does not foreclose absolutely, meaning the mortgagor is able to regain ownership of his or her property at the end of the day. Nevertheless, the right of foreclosure is no longer needed or useful because of its undesirable effects on the interest of the mortgagor. The scenario video involves the foreclosure of Mr. and Mrs. Park's house, but as stated herein, the courts are more willing to issue the right of possession and the right of sale instead of the right of foreclosure. That being said, let's move on to the right of possession. The right of possession involves the mortgagee being in the state of having, owning or controlling the mortgagor's property. It can be said that the right of possession goes hand in hand with the right of sale because before the mortgagee puts up the mortgagor's property for sale, the mortgagee must ensure that the mortgagor's property is empty and unoccupied. Apart from that, the mortgagee can remain in charge of the mortgagor's property and for example, rent out the mortgagor's property in order to get back the money lent to the mortgagor. With regard to the mortgagee's recourse to the right of possession, Justice Harmon in both cases of Alliance Perpetual Building Society and Belram Investments Limited and others, and Four Mates Limited and Dudley Marshall Properties Limited, stated that the mortgagee is entitled to the right of possession at any time, regardless of whether or not the mortgagor is guilty of failing to pay back the money borrowed from the mortgagee. This was subsequently reiterated in the case of Wopai Galak and Barclays Bank. Now I'll pass on to Amanda, who will critically analyze whether or not the right of possession strikes an appropriate balance in protecting the interests of both the mortgagee and the mortgagor. Thank you, Kelsey. I will be further elaborating on the law on possession. As mentioned, the mortgagee's ability to take possession arises as of right and they need not obtain a court order due to the interest they have in the land. However, in practice, a mortgagee will rarely seek possession in the absence of default by the mortgager. A court order would provide assurance that the mortgager will not defeat the mortgage on grounds of undue influence. Nonetheless, the danger still occurs when such an unqualified right is arbitrarily used by a capricious mortgagee. A mortgagee may seize upon any minor and temporary default to justify taking possession, depriving the mortgager of any opportunity to remedy his default. Section 36 of the Administration Justice Act 1970 offers statutory restrictions on the mortgagee's rights to possession. It aims to protect the mortgager by granting the court discretion to suspend, adjourn or postpone possession of a dwelling house. Such relief can only be awarded when the court is satisfied that the mortgager is likely to be able to pay any sums due under the mortgage within a reasonable period. In the case of Western Bank and Schindler, it was confirmed that Section 36 would apply regardless of whether the mortgager was in default or not. Thus, the mortgage's supposed absolute rights to possession will only be exercisable with the permission of the court and when there is good faith. Section 36 was later amended by Section 8 of the Administration of Justice Act 1973. Through the amendment, an early limitation through default clauses rendered the whole capital sum payable when there are errors arising. Section 8 now in the picture, only the errors had to be paid within a reasonable time and not the entire mortgage debt, providing more relief to mortgages. Nevertheless, the mortgages' protections under Section 36 is subject to some limitations under common law. Firstly, the protection under Section 36 is only available in respect of dwelling houses and does not apply to commercial premises. Reference will be made to the state of premises at the time the order for possession was sought to determine if it is a dwelling house. Secondly, the court's discretion arises when there is an application for order for possession by the mortgagee. Without it, the court will have no jurisdiction to control or suspend the possession. Next, the reasonable period for mortgages to pay any sums will be up to the court's discretion. 
but the period of time must be stipulated and cannot be left indeterminate. The case of Norgan stated that the duration of the whole mortgage term would be a reasonable period of for suspension of the mortgagee's possession order and repayment by the mortgager. If the mortgager breached the terms of the suspension, the mortgagee has to apply for an immediate enforcement of the possession order. In attempts to strike a balance between the commercial interests of the mortgagee and the need for the mortgager to maintain his home, Lord Justice Evans suggested some relevant considerations that courts should take into account, such as the mortgager's financial prospects. If there are no prospects of the mortgager making a reasonable attempt to repay the accumulated areas, the court will have no discretion to make the order for relief. Additionally, a mortgagee should comply with the procedures under the pre-action protocol for possession claims based on mortgage, which protects the rights of both the mortgager and the mortgagee. The protocol ensures effective communication between the two parties and mortgagees will be kept fully informed of their debts, where they can avoid repossession by selling their property or rescheduling payment. Originally, only the mortgagees whose mortgager defaults on payments under the mortgage will be protected under the absolute and immediate right to possession. Now, with Section 36 of Section 8 in place, along with common law relief, this certainly offers adequate protection for the mortgager as well. Hence, there is arguably an appropriate balance struck between protecting both the mortgager and the mortgagee. In order to maintain the balance, the courts must continue to reflect individual circumstances as well as public interest and parliamentary purpose in exercising discretion in granting possession. I will now be passing on to Uttara, who will be discussing the power of sale. Thank you, Amanda. Other than foreclosure and possession, the mortgagee has the power of sale. Generally, a mortgage will contain an express power of sale, and if it does not, by virtue of Section 101, Subsection 1 of the LPA 1925, the mortgagee has an implied power of sale made by deed. The question is, are the mortgagee and mortgagee's interests protected equally? To answer this question, we will look at five things. Firstly, this subject to any express provisions in the mortgage, the mortgagee will be able to sell the mortgage property if two conditions are fulfilled. First, the power of sale must have arisen. As the case of 20th century banking illustrates, this happens when the legal or contractual date for redemption has passed. Second, the power of sale must be exercisable after the requirements of Section 103 are satisfied. Therefore, the mortgager is protected because the mortgagee is restricted to the two conditions which must be satisfied before he can utilize his power of sale. Secondly, the consequences of a sale. Section 105 states that the proceeds of the sale will be used to satisfy the debt owed by the mortgager and associated liabilities. The provision further provides that the surplus of the sale should be given to any person entitled under the mortgage. In effect, any person entitled other than the mortgager would refer to subsequent mortgagees. In practice, provided that the property value has not fallen too far and that subsequent mortgagees operated a sensible lending policy, there should be enough money to pay off the debt of the selling mortgagee and the money owed under later mortgages. In summary, when a mortgagee exercises his power of sale, he should not make any profit as the debt owed already includes the mortgage interest rate. Thirdly, the mortgagee's conduct of the sale is regulated. In the case of Standard Chartered Bank, it was held that a mortgagee is under a duty of care to obtain the best price reasonably obtainable. In Cockmere Brick Co., Justice Salman states that even if a mortgagee accepts an exceptionally low bid at a public auction, his duty is satisfied. In contrast, Bishop demonstrates that if a mortgagee breaches this duty, it will result in an award of compensation of the difference in the price obtained and the true price reasonably obtainable. In summary, the duty placed on the mortgagee ensures that he takes the appropriate steps to find the best price for the sale. 
Fourthly, the mortgager is further protected because he may apply to the court under Section 91 for an order requiring a sale. This is beneficial to the mortgager whose outstanding mortgage is greater than the value of the property because the sale in these circumstances will crystallize the mortgager's immediate liability. Nevertheless, the mortgager is still liable to repay the whole sum borrowed, although insurance can be obtained for this eventually. Moreover, in mortgage services funding, the court held that it was just and equitable to order a sale to avoid injustice towards the mortgages whose house value had depreciated considerably. In summary, the interests of the mortgager are protected so as to avoid putting him in a position that is worse than prior to him taking the mortgage. However, by virtue of Section 2, Subsection 1 and Section 101, Subsection 1, the mortgagee does not need to take possession of the property prior to sale because he has the power to convey legal estate to the purchaser. This is illustrated in Horsham Properties where the mortgages could not rely on statutory protection provided by Section 36 of the Administration of Justice Act 1970 because it is only available when the mortgagee seeks an, a possession order. This is unfair to mortgages because it provides the mortgagee the liberty to sidestep the protection given to mortgages of dwelling houses. However, as Dixon states, the most reputable institutional lenders are very unlikely to eject mortgages without a possession order. Although initiatives such as the Home Repossession Bill in 2019 have taken place, nothing has come of it. And as the law stands, this sidestep does not entail an infringement of the mortgages rights. In summary, the power of sale generally protects the mortgager and the mortgagee's interests equally. However, in the case where a mortgagee possesses the house prior to sale, the law has no remedy to the effect of putting the mortgager at a disadvantage. I will now pass it on to Jenny, who will discuss undue influence, backdoor tactics and mortgages during COVID-19. Thank you, Uthra. With the current economic downturn resulting from COVID-19, many people have resorted to taking out second mortgages on their homes in order to support themselves and their businesses for now. Unfortunately, this spike in desperate loan seekers opens up the door for undue influence to take place. In many situations, mortgagers end up signing complex agreements that they may not understand. There may exist a degree of undue influence where the mortgagor has been inappropriately pressured to sign the agreement. Fortunately, if the mortgagor can establish in court that the agreement was signed this way, he may be able to have the court set aside the mortgage. In Royal Bank of Scotland and Ettridge, Lord Nicholls stated that undue influence may take many forms, not just threats of physical force, but other unacceptable forms of pressure. This includes taking advantage of a relationship where there is a presumed trust and confidence. Little and Cree held that undue influence can include a deliberate non-disclosure of relevant information. Justice Richards went on to draw a distinction between an inadvertent non-disclosure and a deliberate concealment or suppression of material facts, where only deliberate concealment amounts to undue influence. The inappropriate pressure may not always stem from the bank. As there are more borrowers than lenders, it seems unlikely that the banks would be so desperate as to resort to pressure borrowers to take loans from them. Sometimes, the undue influence can stem from third parties. This was seen in the case of Barclays Bank and O'Brien, where a husband had unduly influenced his wife to take out a second mortgage on their matrimonial home. The purpose of this mortgage was to help prop up Mr. O'Brien's failing business. And while Mrs. O'Brien was reluctant, Mr. O'Brien was very persistent. Usually, if the undue influence came from the mortgagee, the simple solution would be to prevent the mortgagee from recovering its money. However, in this case, the mortgagee was essentially innocent, yet they would be unable to recover their money. At the same time, Mrs. O'Brien was also innocent as her agreement to the loan had been inappropriately obtained. Therefore, the court tried to strike a balance in protecting the commercial interests of the mortgagee and the interests of the mortgager. Here, the court held, that where there was a mortgage loan which would seemingly not benefit the mortgagor in any way, the bank would be put on notice of a risk of undue influence and should take reasonable steps to ensure that the wife's agreement had been obtained properly. 
As this period of time is ridden with financial desperation, the banks may also default to certain backdoor tactics in order to satisfy their own commercial interests. Even if the wife establishes undue influence and sets aside the transaction, the bank may still be able to secure a sale of the property. Furthermore, a mortgagee may pursue concurrent remedies, so even if the sale fails, they may pursue another remedy. This was seen in the case of Alliance and Leicester PLC and Slayford, where Mrs. Slayford had established that the mortgage was agreed to under undue influence. Therefore, the courts, dis- uh, refused, to, uh, the courts refused the mortgagee's application for possession against Mrs. Slayford. Despite this, the mortgagee still reserved the right to sue the mortgages on a personal covenant. The mortgagee then proceeded to declare Mr. Slayford bankrupt. This made it so that the bank became an interested person who could then apply for an order of sale. This could unfortunately become more common, as everyone, including the banks, are undergoing financial hardships. Therefore, as seen in the scenario video, banks are likely to be more unforgiving towards Mr. and Mrs. Hortenses all around the world in order to favour their own business survival. The courts do try to remedy this situation, but as seen in the Alliance case, their hands are essentially tied if the banks resort to such backdoor tactics. Fortunately, other parties are stepping in to help mortgagors. For example, the Financial Conduct Authority has introduced a payment break scheme where borrowers are able to request an initial 90-day payment break and a further 90-day break where necessary. This means that borrowers are able to defer their mortgage payment by up to 180 days. The Financial Conduct Authority has also announced that no responsible lender should pursue any possession action at the time, as doing so would likely contravene Principle 6 of the FCA Handbook and the MCOB 2.5A1R. Furthermore, Rule 55 of the Civil Procedure Amendment No. 5, Coronavirus Rules 2020, has put a stay on all proceedings for warrants of possession from 22nd August 2020 until 20th September 2020. Now, Ashraf will conclude our thoughts on whether or not an appropriate balance has been struck between the interests of mortgagers and mortgagees. With that being said, it is seen that the law on foreclosure favours the mortgagee. However, its application is rare in modern times. On the other hand, both the law of possession and sale seem to strike an appropriate balance in protecting the interests of the mortgagee and mortgager. With the current COVID-19 pandemic, the balance shifts in favour of the mortgager because of the action and initiatives taken by the United Kingdom government Considering that a mortgager is an individual person, while the mortgagee is a company, the law must protect the mortgager because he is in a more vulnerable position than a mortgagee. Thank you very much. Case closed.